Math with Business Applications, Simple Interest, Section 9.1. Her first objective is to, is to solve a simple interest problem. Simple interest is something that's commonly used on short-term loans that are less than one year, and it's defined as the charge for the loan. In other words, it's the charge on the entire principal for the entire length of the loan. The formula is I, the interest, is found by taking P, the principal, which is the loan amount, times R, the interest rate charged, expressed as a decimal, times T, which stands for the length of the loan, and this value must be in years. Let's look at our first example. Here they're giving information about the loan. They're asking us to calculate the interest. So we'll use our simple interest formula where the loan amount is the principal. The rate is the R. We'll convert that as a decimal. And the length of the loan is T for time. Replacing those values with the variables in the formula, we'll multiply the three values together. And again, note one, that your percentage is converted into an equivalent decimal. And two, your time is in years. And instead of the fraction, they've put the decimal equivalency. After multiplying those three values together, the charge for this loan, the amount of money for a year and a half, given the rate, will be $500.44. In this next example, they're giving us the following information about a loan. They're asking us to calculate interest. We will replace the principal with the loan amount, the rate as a decimal, and in this case, the time or the length of the loan is given in months. The formula requires that we express our time in terms of years. So since there are 12 months in a year, we will express the length of the loan as 7 twelfths. When you calculate this, you can use your fraction key on your calculator, but I think it's easier to simply multiply by 7 and divide by 12 when you get to this portion of the formula. Final answer you should arrive at is $246.09. If necessary, since this is money, you should round always to two decimal places or the nearest penny or cent. Next, we're going to calculate maturity value. What is maturity value? It is the amount that must be repaid when the loan is due. Not only is it the interest that we just calculated, but it's also the original amount that was borrowed. In other words, the principal. So maturity value is found by taking the principal, the loan amount, plus the interest that we just got done calculating. So here, let's look at a couple of examples. They're asking us for the maturity value. We just saw that formula. We can tell right now what the principal is. It's the amount that's borrowed, but we need to do some calculation. The interest is found by taking the principal times the rate times the time. So we'll take this information. We can express it in a formula, replacing the variables. Here is our principal amount. Here's our calculation for the interest, but we have some special handling with our time. Time is not in years, so we need to express it in years. And since it's months, we will put the 18 over 12. Order of operations, you should multiply first and then add. Your scientific calculator will probably let you put this all in and hit an equals at the end to arrive at the correct value. Here we have the details. The interest is over $1,000. When added to the principal, gives us a final maturity value of almost $14,000. We have another example asking us for maturity value. The same steps will follow here as in the last one. Maturity value is found by principal. We know that amount. Here, the amount borrowed plus the interest. We need to calculate the interest found by taking the principal times the rate times the time. The rate is a decimal and time 
was given in years, we swapped out the fraction for the decimal equivalency. You can calculate your interest first. If you do, it's $11,011. $11. Add that to the principal to give us a final maturity value. This is what the borrower would ultimately have to pay in total to clear themselves of the debt. Loans can not only be in years and months, but they also can be in days. So we need to calculate or be able to calculate the number of days. We have another term in the business world, and it is term, no pun intended. When you hear the word term in a business setting, they're discussing the length of the loan. And if we wanted to know the length or term of a loan that started on March 10th and is due August 20th, your textbook on page 349 has the number of days in a year. Also, the inside cover of your book, or if you go to Google, you should be able to pull up the days of the year table. And here's what it looks like. In this example, here's our days of the year chart. The first column has all the days of a month and then corresponding months of the year going further out to the right. So here's how it works. August, since it's later in the year than March, is the first day of the year that we want to calculate. So we will go down the chart until we get to the 20th day and read across until we're corresponding and under the column with August in it. So August 20th is the 232nd day of the year. March 10th, we go down to the 10th day and read across until it corresponds with March. March 10th is the 69th day. And the question is, what is the term or length of this loan with the starting ending date given? We will subtract the day of the year associated with August 20th, the day of the year March 10th is associated with, and the difference will be the term of this loan, or 163 days. We have another example here asking us for the term of a loan starting on January 5th to July 23rd. Just like the last one, July 23rd is further in the month. So we'll start with that. We'll go down to 23 and read until it cor read across until we correspond with the column heading July, which is the 204th day. I'm not sure you need a chart to know that January 5th is the fifth day. The difference is 190 day, 99 days for the length of this loan. There are loans that carry over from a start date into the beginning of the next year, and that's what this example is. We have one starting September 15th, continuing to the end of the year, and ending on February 20th. So, we have two calculations here. We need to know how many days from our start date to the end of the year. Well, we will always work with non-leap years, so there's 365 days, and then how many days from January 1 until the due date on this loan. We found that February 20th is the 51st day, so we know there's 51 days from January 1 until there. So we need to go back and do our calculation here from September 15th to the end of the year, 365 minus the September 15th day is 107 days. January 1 until the maturity date is 51 days, and we'll add those two together for a total of 158 days. Now we have that table where we can read the value, but you actually can use what's called the knuckle method. If you can envision that you have put your hands together with your index finger of your left hand here with July and your index finger of your right hand here for August, these bumps or crests are knuckles and these are the months 
of the year that have 31 days. The space in between our knuckles are the months that do not have 31 days. All of them have 30 except for February, which has 28. And then, of course, on a leap year, it has 29 days. So from this, we can visually look at our knuckles and determine, for example, if the problem was how many days between May 10th and August 15th, to get us to the end of May, since May is a knuckle, that would be 31 days. 31 minus 10 means there's 21 days left to the end of May. We have June, which is down here between two knuckles. That means it has 30 days. Then we go to July. It's a knuckle, so that's another 31 days. And we're going to August 15th. So from August 1 to August 15 would be another 15 days. Add these numbers up will give us the number of days between the two dates. So just a fun, perhaps, calculation for determining term given in days instead of using the table. Use your knuckles. Next, we're going to look at exact and ordinary interest. We're still using the same formula. But when our time is not in years, we need to express it in terms of years. And we've already seen when we have something in months, we express it as 5 twelfths. If it is in days, there are two possibilities. We can put it over 65. We call this exact interest. Or we can put it over 360 which is called ordinary interest or banker's interest. This 360 comes back from the days and still stays today. It's the most common number of days in the year to be calculating interest when the term is in days. But it came historically because 360 is a much nicer number to work with when you don't have a calculator. A lot of numbers are divisible in 360, where 365 is not as nice. The key thing here is to read very carefully. When you use exact, or when exact interest is asked, you will use 365 for the number of days in a year. If they ask you for ordinary, or banker's interest, you will use 360. So let's do a calculation. Given the following information, they're asking us to determine the amount due under exact interest and ordinary interest. First, though, we need to do some calculations. How long is this loan? So we go through the same steps before. We'll look up December 20th. It's the 354th day. We will look up July 15th. Subtract those 158 days. Then use our simple interest formula. Because it's exact, we will use 365 for our conversion of our days into what part of a year and do the calculation multiply by 158 divided by 365 to give us that exact interest. Ordinary interest, we already know the number of days, but we need to express it as a, in terms of a year. And because it's ordinary, well, we, we, we will put 360 to express it in terms of years to give us a value of a little more. We're dividing by a smaller number, so our interest ends up being higher. One note here, as I kind of alluded to, normally we will be only looking for ordinary or banker's interest throughout the remainder of this book. If it says exact, use the 365. Otherwise, we will be using 360.